first photos from the Webb telescope. I disagree with those who cry miracle. I'm going against the current. The first images made by the James Webb telescope are not extraordinary, unbelievable, fantastic, or wonderful as almost all the media were quick to titular, and least of all, exciting, moving, momentous, and beautiful as the people on social media were quick to point out. They are neither more nor less than what was expected from a machine costing $11 billion and designed with every care over more than two decades of continuous technological evolution. Or is it? Personally, I also expected something better, but I realized the fact that these are still first light images and therefore still quite far from that color rendition and resolution to which we will be able to arrive soon. What is more, the urgency to produce results quickly to show to the media and taxpayers must have also played a not insignificant role in the less than perfect success of the operation. In partial justification, however, it must be said that Webb was designed to become the natural heir to the venerable Hubble, launched in 1990 but in many ways it is something completely different, starting with the diameter of the primary mirror. Webb collects seven times more light than Hubble, which for the same exposure time allows it to photograph objects 10 to 100 times fainter. The resolving power, that is the ability to show small details of astronomical objects, also depends on the size of the mirror. But not only that, it also affects the wavelength of the light in which it is observed. So the larger the diameter and shorter the wavelength, the higher the resolution and the amount of visible detail. In visible light, Hubble can achieve an angular resolution of about 0.04 arc seconds, a sharpness that would allow it to distinguish from Earth, for example, two lights 50 centimeters apart located on the Moon. In contrast, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is much larger, observes in the infrared at longer wavelengths. Therefore, contrary to what one might think, the two almost offset each other, and the resolution achieved by Hubble and Webb in their images is virtually equal. Webb's perception of higher quality occurs because its images are much deeper and show objects and details too faint to appear in Hubble. Although the infrared observations lose some resolution, however, they allow the study of objects in regions of space otherwise obscured in the visible spectrum by gas and dust. Moreover, because the universe is constantly expanding, the light coming at us from receding stars and galaxies tends to shift towards the red, reaching the detector with a reduced frequency and consequent increase in wavelength, the famous redshift. These objects are therefore more easily detected when observed with instruments optimized for infrared. That said, there are several things I didn't like about this, which, rather than a scientific presentation, seemed to me to be a marketing operation carried out by NASA to extol, mind you rightly so, the qualities of its new instrument. For one thing, I was not particularly thrilled with the choice of subjects. I got the impression that NASA wanted to avoid a direct comparison with Hubble's best images when the opposite should have been done. In my opinion, Webb's team should have been confronted with the best Hubble images, such as the Horse and Nebula or the Pillars of Creation, the Extreme Deep Field, the Bubble Nebula, the Whirlpool Galaxy, the Cat's Eye Nebula, the Mystic Mountain in the Carina Nebula, and so on. In short, the choice should have fallen on objects already made famous by Hubble in photographs, those yes, truly epic making. Anyone among the general public would thus have been able to judge the actual improvements brought by Webb. Also, and especially thanks to the cooling of the whole instrument to minus 240 degrees Celsius, capable of almost totally eliminating background noise. Hang on a sec, guys, before we continue. Be sure to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell. You will help us to make products of even higher quality. But let's look in more detail at some of these famous photos. The first to be presented was the one immediately dubbed by the media as the first Webb Deep Field, which is a very deep shot of a large cluster of galaxies located in the southern constellation of Flying Fish at a distance of 4.6 billion light years. The cluster acts as a gravitational lens, bending the light of some much more distant galaxies that lie behind the cluster and appear in the images as distorted arcs of light. 
Note the presence of rather annoying spikes in the brighter objects due to the thin slits between the primary mirror segments and also to two of the three secondary mirror mounts. The upper third mount, however, is responsible for the fainter horizontal spikes. The framed field, just 1 20th the size of the moon's angular diameter, had already been photographed by Hubble in 2017, and it is precisely that image which was not made to be presented to the general public, but was just a routine image that NASA, which evidently likes to win easy, chose to set up the comparison with Webb. Too bad, we would have liked to see a bolder comparison, perhaps with one of Hubble's famous deep fields. Carina Nebula NGC 3324 is a small portion of the Carina Nebula, one of the most extensive star-forming regions in the sky, about 8,000 light-years away in the southern constellation of the same name. The image, made by Webb, paints, needless to say, a cosmic scene reminiscent of that of a craggy mountain range on a moonlit evening. In reality, it is the edge of the giant gaseous cavity hollowed out by the intense ultraviolet radiation and stellar winds from the hot young stars visible at the top of the image. The violent, ultraviolet radiation is sculpting the wall of the nebula by slowly eroding it. Pillars of dust about seven light years high tower above the wall of glowing gas that appears to rise from the mountains, but is actually the ionized gas flying away due to the relentless action of the radiation. Because of its ability to work in the infrared, Webb can penetrate the dust and gas to reveal the birth of new stars, which appear as red dots immersed in the nebular part. All very nice, and the comparison with a similar Hubble shot is even merciless if one looks at the two images at their highest resolution. But again, the comparison was set on one of the poorest photographic shots of those taken by Hubble, and also quite old, since it was made by summing two shots from 2006 and 2008 obtained with just hours of exposure. If one wanted to stay within the scope of the Carina Nebula, it would have been fairer to compare, for example, with the extraordinary shot Hubble took in 2010 of the Herberg object Haro 901 with nine hours of exposure. What do you guys think? The Southern Ring Nebula The third bad figure set in friendship. NASA made it by inventing a comparison of two images of the planetary nebula NGC 3132, known as the Southern Ring Nebula, as opposed to the more famous Ring Nebula located in the Boreal sky. In fact, this object, just one arc first in angular diameter and one light year in true diameter, is also visible in the southern skies, 2,000 light years away in the Vela constellation. But what is a planetary nebula? Well, as we know, large mass stars ran out of fuel in a few million years, so much so that they end their lives in an explosion that completely destroys them. Sun-like stars, on the other hand, have a life cycle of billions of years, and near the end of their existence, they are affected by periodic ejections of their outer layers. The material ejected on the outside thus goes on to form a kind of ever-expanding shell around the parent star, which has since become a white dwarf. And it is this shell of matter, which we from Earth perceive as the disk of a planet observed through a small telescope, that has earned in the past, when it was impossible to understand what it was, the name Planetary Nebula. Again, we must admit that the image made by Webb is definitely deeper and more detailed than Hubble's. There are many more filaments and much more material in the peripheral regions. Even some distant galaxies peep out transpiring from the dust surrounding the nebula. And yet we must also point out the fact that the Hubble image was made as far back as 1995 and with only one hour of exposure. Once again, in short, to make the comparison, we went for an object photographed by Hubble in a hurry and certainly not to the best of its ability. On the subject of planetary nebulae, we would have liked to instead to see an equal comparison of objects such as the stunning NGC 6153 and the extraordinary Ant Nebula. But that's the way it is now, and patience. Stefan's Quintet Webb's fourth take left me with mixed feelings. Stefan's Webb version of the Quintet is a mosaic constructed from a thousand individual images. The frame field covers about one fifth the angular diameter of the moon. It is Webb's largest image to date. 
Using infrared vision, Webb shows important details in the five galaxies that make up the cluster, such as myriad regions of star formation and large tails of gas, dust, and stars that the objects exchange with each other due to gravitational interactions. In fact, these galaxies, which are perhaps one of the most studied groups of interactors in history, are so close together that they warp each other due to mutual gravity, so close that they will most likely end up merging into one very large galaxy. Needless to mention, this famous cluster has been at the center of a cosmological dispute over the relationship between distance and redshift for decades. Since the galaxy NGC 7320, the leftmost one shows a much lower redshift than the others, while appearing to be the object at the same distance. In fact, it was later found to be much closer. 40 million light years compared to 290 million light years for the others. What about Hubble, you may ask? Well, on superficial examination, the Hubble version is not so different. To appreciate the differences, one must compare the two photos magnified to the highest resolution. Only then will the details uncovered by Webb leap to the eye. I confess, however, that even in this case, I expected even more from Webb. More that will probably come in the next few months once I get some experience with instrumentation. WASP 96b, the planet of another star. Webb offered its most convincing evidence where there was almost no chance of comparison with Hubble, and that was in analyzing the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet. Located in the Phoenix constellation, WASP 96b is 1,150 light years away from us. It is a planet half the size of Jupiter and very hot, orbiting its sun-like star for three and a half days. Well, on June 21st, Webb Spectrograph examined WASP-96 light for 6.4 hours as the planet transited the star's disk. And the spectrum shows the unmistakable signature of water, the presence of haze, and evidence of clouds, which were thought not to exist based on previous observations. Although Hubble has also analyzed numerous exoplanet atmospheres over the past two decades and captured the first detection of water in 2013, Webb's look at this first planet represents a giant leap forward in efforts to characterize potentially habitable planets beyond Earth. The Hubble Space Telescope, in fact, was primarily focused on the search for water because of its narrow spectral window but Webb covers an extraordinarily wide range of wavelengths, including visible red light and a portion of the spectrum that was previously inaccessible by other telescopes. This part of the spectrum is particularly sensitive to water and other key molecules such as oxygen, methane, and carbon dioxide, which are not immediately evident in the WASP-96b spectrum but should be detectable on other exoplanets. This was only the first step an initial experiment done in haste for demonstration purposes. But in the future, we will get to analyze the atmosphere of Earth-like planets as well. In short, I conclude by reiterating that, in my opinion, Webb's team cheated a bit to win easily against the poor old Hubble, but also that with time, Webb's performance will improve a lot and give us great satisfaction, especially in the field of extrasolar planets. I would like to know your opinion in the comments below and be sure to watch our other videos through the YouTube end screens and playlists.